I'm quite a tiny bit behind. Uh, we now uh, are going to have a presentation from Andrew Hopkins. Uh, Andrew is an architectural historian, and he's doing uh, work uh, on Longina uh, uh, at the Cortrell Institute. Um, he has taught at Liverpool Monash, at Monash University, and at the Royal Melbourne uh, Institute of Technology. And he's going to be uh, at Reading University in the next academic year. So, um, Andrew Hopkins. I wonder if you can put those... Do you want those I think they would need to go down and the lights off, otherwise they won't... So you've, you've, got, it, you've got it all here. Right, the lines are going down. down. Lights. What's happened to that? What are those? Oh, we're in business. Okay, you all right? Yeah, thank you. Now, the church, and I hope you can all hear me, the church of Santa Maria della Salute, designed and built by Baldessare Longhena from 1631 marks the culmination of the development of ceremonial architecture in Venice, which began with the construction of the Porta della Carta in the 1430s. It belongs to the mature phase of development when ritual clearly influenced the actual design of new buildings, such as the Church of the Redentore, which is in many ways the prototype for the Salute. Both churches were commissioned to function primarily as the destination of an annual, ritual, annual ducal ritual and were designed specifically for that ritual usage. There's documentary evidence that ritual considerations were extremely influential for the design of the Salute. This design is composed of two main sections, and you see on the left of you and on the right, a bit blurred, but a plan of, of the church. Uh, the first is what's known as the rotunda, or octagonal space surrounded by an ambulatory and surmounted by a large German dome. Then, joined to that, you have a sanctuary as it's called in the documents, beginning with a presbytery with two lateral absidal spaces. Then the main altar, and behind that uh, is, of course, the choir. On the 13th of April, 1631, Longena presented the first of two memoranda explaining his design to the deputies and the Senate. Item five of this memorandum explains, one enters by the main door of the facade and there will also be two small doors, one hidden on either side for the people during the main feast day. And I think that's fairly clear. You can see here the main door and on either side two smaller doors you see that they're not terribly easy to see. That's the small door there, as opposed to the large door in the centre. <laughs> Although centra of centralised design, the Salute has, in a certain sense, a nave and aisles, each with its own door. However, the ambulatory bays also function in some respects like the narthex of San Marco, as a prelude to the main space of the rotunda. And I think here you can see, this is a plan of San Marco, here's the narthex, which originally continued all around here to the main space inside. And in a way, if you, we, there are many ways you can read this design, but certainly one of those is that the ambulatory here and all around serves in a certain sense as a narthex, as a, which is a particularly Byzantine feature rather than the Western architecture one. <coughs> Uh, the other way, of course, of reading it is that as you come in, there's a nave in the centre, which you certainly get the effect from the pillars, and the other one is the side eyes, which go around here. I mean, that's, that's I'm stretching a bit, but anyway. Longena says in his memorandum why the building was designed in this way. There will be six chapels with six altars 
closed off by columns, with a corridor which serves some moving easily from one chapel to the other, with the mass, but without having to go into the church. And being in the middle of the main cupola, as you see more or less of you on the left, that is in the middle of the church, one will easily see all the chapels and the altars that there will be. Next, between the large nave of this church and these chapels, there will be space so that one is able to move around the building with the processions of the main feast days without the impediment of the people that will, what one will find in the church. Thus, Longena believed that he had designed a church to be particularly appropriate for carrying out the liturgical requirements of the feast day mass with the Doge and Signoria, which was the principal function of the church. This is one of the ducal andate that we talked about, uh, or it's been spoken about during the day, where the Doge and Signoria would come to the church for mass. The deputies appointed by the Senate to supervise the Salute Commission also spoke of the church in terms of ritual usage in their final report which they presented to the Senate after the subsequent competition and litigation between Longena and his only serious rival, Il Fraqueo. This report explains the criteria that have been used for the new church and indicate the attention paid to ritual usage. We've proposed to ourselves three conditions which we require and must obtain as main features of the work. The first is that the church be understood such that upon entering, the eye can see the whole and spaciousness of it all with ease, and that your serenity and the excellent Senate are content while visiting the church, and so that the people, because of their overabundant excitement, don't violate the doge and signory when they come together here. <laughs> Interesting. Secondly, a proportionality and bright light equally disposed. And thirdly, a concerto, such that the altars are well disposed in the body of the church and equally rich on left and right, with the, main with the elevation of the main altar in greater majesty, and I think you can see the main altar from the here, and such a location and arrangement that when entering it can be well seen, and also that as one processes through the, as one processes to this altar, that is through the main body of the church, all the other altars are able to be seen. Now this effect I've tried, it's not very sophisticated, but anyway, there's a photograph as you're coming through the church of an altar, and as you get to the center, of course, it comes into view. You can see it much more clearly. I think that's fairly obvious. We consider these the main criteria, and further, there are other conditions not less necessary, that the model fits the site, and that it has the majesty of a great and famous machina, and that there is sufficient space to build a monastery for the religious. The idea of the machina I will turn to later, but it's important to note that apart from the Tridentine requirement that the church be well lit, the two other main criteria relate specifically to how the church will be experienced by the Doge and Signoria as they proceed through the church on the day of their annual visit. We know that after choosing Longena's design, the Senate then considered changing the site of the Salute to the Punta della Dugana, that is, to place it more or less in this area here. This was rejected for several reasons, relating mainly to the insurmountable expenses which would be incurred. Longena also rejected the change of site, as it would mean that his design would have to be radically altered and the church reduced to having only one facade to match those of San Giorgio Maggiore and the Church of the Redentore. When the Salute was reallocated to the original site, several changes were made. The building was enlarged by increasing the width of the corridors, as had been suggested in the deputy's final report, and the Scuola della Trinita, which used to be on the site, and which was supposed to have re been rebuilt on the right of the Salute to match the monastery on the left, was in fact removed from the project. Briefly, to explain without going into too much detail, uh, there was a uh, church of the Trinita here, and there was a squalor somewhere in this area. The original proposition was that this church would be framed in a way on either side by a natural monastery and a squalor. Um, certainly the squalor you don't see today and the monastery uh, is a much later design. Building of the church began with the foundations, but when these were completed and the construction of the building proper about to commence, 
Longena's original design underwent further modifications and the sanctuary was redesigned. This change occurred in 1635 rather than in 1656, as has been stated by Vico van Muraro. It is thus not related to the change in iconographical program for the external sculpture, which has been linked to the return of the previously banned Jesuits in 1656. While the alteration to the iconography does have a political significance in that St. Mark and other Venetian saints were replaced by the Virgin and more orthodox saints, the changes to the sanctuary date from September 1635, and it's my contention that they relate to ritual usage. And this is a design I found of the Archivio di Stato in Venice, uh, on the back of a polizzo estimate by Longena for the building of the church. Uh, and I think it's quite clear, um, without going into too much detail, that uh, this is clearly a redesign of the presbytery and the choir that you see here. This is, of course, how it was built, and more or less the measurements of the built church are uh, exactly the same as the new measurements that you see uh, in this design. On the 1st of September, Longena wrote a polizzo, or estimate, for the building of six windows in the sanctuary and two windows in the choir. On the reverse is this design, which indicates that the sanctuary was remodeled. The written measurements indicate the proposed new lengths and the actual built form, but they do not correspond to the lengths of the design as we see it here, which appear to have been copied from the original design. Uh, that is, Longano's obviously copying from the original plan, which we don't know about, but certainly existed. He's copying the outline, and then he's adding different new measurements uh, for, the, for the new uh, sanctuaries that would be built. The enlarged space is modelled on that of the Church of the Redentore, and you see a plan of the Redentore here on the left, which was a prototype for the Salute, more or less from the beginning. The, the Redentore was in fact a prototype, seems evident from Fraccao's second memorandum, probably presented two days after Longana's project, where he presented a quadrangular project and a centralised rotunda design. In this presentation, he says it would be very useful for the Doge to know, firstly, the measurements of the Redentore, uh, which is obviously serving as a model for the new votive church. And then after that, he presents uh, his own measurements for his church, which is a more or less a scaled-up version of the Redentore. The body of the cupola, with the two half-moons where the Serenissima Signoria sits, is 47 feet long and 82 feet wide. Now, that's more or less this area here. These are referred to as half moons, mezze lume, as interestingly are all windows in churches. Uh, they're not called uh, finestre termale, they're called uh, mezze lume, which I think is quite interesting. So in the two mezze lume here, uh, the other interesting thing about this is that it clearly tells us that, you know, once and for all documentarily, that this is where the Doge and Signoria will sit. For his own design, which will be very similar to the Redentory, the place where the main altar will be and where the Serenissima Signoria will be seated will be 55 feet long and 84 feet wide. That is, 8 feet wider and 2 feet longer than the Redentore. By contrast, Longena in his first report had described his sanctuary as having measurements significantly smaller than that of the Redentore in this area. Item 7. Next there will be the sanctuary where one will find the main altar of the Beata Vergine. From the stairs that lead into the sanctuary to the columns behind the altar will measure 37 feet in length and 60 feet in width. That is 10 feet less in length than the Redentore and 22 feet less in width than that. So it's considerably smaller. However, in the new design, which you see what well, you've seen, uh, it is precisely the sanctuary which is enlarged in order to accommodate the Doge and the Signoria, based upon their requirements as known from the Redentore. The presbytery that is shown in this design and which was built is 42 feet in length and 88 feet wide. That is five feet less in length than the Redentore, but six feet more in width, more or less uh, the same. The choir remained 30 feet in length, but was widened to 42 feet. 
that the interior space of the presbytery of the Surte was the focus of change can be seen from the fact that the design itself only depicts the interior of the church. The exterior is not drawn, and it was ex the exterior which suffered from this alteration. I don't have a photo, but more or less the two of the la very large and probably the most famous feature of the Surte, the volutes, were in fact chopped off by the drum of the minor cupola. So you can see quite clearly here that Longanio is indicating it's really only the interior of the space. I mean, he doesn't deal with the outside at all. And the enlargement, in fact, results in the exterior walls of the presbytery crushing against the exterior walls of the rotunda. It's really a complete mess. The most important precedent for the design of the sanctuary at the Salute in many respects, is that of San Marco itself, which was the ducal chapel, that is the private chapel of the Doge. It was here that ducal ri rituals originated, and it was from here that the Doge and the Signoria went to the churches of the Redentore and the Salute after first hearing a mass at San Marco. Thus the ritual requirements were similar. From this plan, not very well known as it ought to be, uh, conserved at the Biblioteca Marciana by Zata, presumably, it's at least affixed in the back of his book, we can see how the seating at San Marco was arranged. And the area we're focusing on, it's, it is a little bit hard to see, but there are three lines of benches on either side uh, in the space itself, with a further bench all the way around, actually against the, more or less against the circumstances and against the walls. And the doge of the throne is here, and there's another throne here, probably for the celebrant. The Dogen Signoria usually entered San Marco by the side door, the Porta Media, if they're going to the church, and then went to their seats which were located behind, between the iconostasis which they went through and the high altar. Thus they sat in their own sacred space, separated from everyone else by the iconostasis, and this was the precedent for the designs of the Redentore of the Salute. The seating must have been crowded in San Marco, for much larger sanctuaries were built when newly constructing or refurbishing churches, which were the destination of an annual ritual visit. And more or less, explained before about the Arthur Fosri, the Doge would come down there, but usually he would enter by this door, which is in fact in the lodge of the, of the sort of Arthur Fosri complex, and go in here and through the iconostasis up the three stairs and sit there and the rest of the scenery, well, no, obviously not very many of them are going to fit on six benches and or eight benches, but more or less that's where they sat in this area here. Longaina's design for the Salute brings together architectural arrangements developed elsewhere in Venice in order to satisfy the specific ritual requirements of the Ducal Andate and the accompanying mass. The retro choir that we see on the left designed for San Giobbe, oh, I'm sorry, the retro choir designed for San Giobbe in the late Quattrocento and later used by San Savino at San Francesco della Vigna in the 1530s, which is, in fact, what you see on the left, the retro choir being up here behind the altar. Uh, this was also used by Palladio when he designed the church of San Giorgio Maggiore, dating or beginning from 1565, and this is what you see on the right. Again, typically the choir located behind the altar here. It was an effective method of accommodating the choir of the religious order while respecting their privacy by allocating them a separate space in the church. St. Georgia was the site of a ducal ritual and the Doge and Signoria were seated in the large transept with absidal chapels directly under the main dome, which thus conferred status and sacrality more or less this area here, although I'm still a little unsure because if this is the altar of St. Stephen, I wonder whether they're all sat facing this way to hear an altar because they went on St. Stephen's Day. I'm not sure whether they celebrated Mass with the Doge and this altar or perhaps the main altar, but still, I think of, well, I'm not sure what they do. Palladio's work culminated in his design for the Redentore, where the retro choir, together with the triconch arrangement of the presbytery, accommodated the Dogen Signory who went to Mass here annually. 
At the Red and Torre, which was commissioned and financed by the Venetian government, several developments are apparent. I'm sorry about this horrible pink slide. Uh, here the Doge and Signoria are separated from everybody else by three steps and large pillars which spatially and visually isolate them away from the nave space, similar to the effect achieved by their conostasis at San Marco. They are located under the main dome in the most sacred area of the church, both at the Redentore and San Marco. The successful sanctuary design of the Redentore was also obtained at the Salute after several changes to Longena's original design and probably at the specific request of the Signoria. So here at Redentore, again, you can see this design with the absolute um, part of the, with the presbytery, which is where they sat. And you can see by the, the addition of these very uh, sort of screening elements of columns uh, that visually from the nave, your, more or less your vision is focused on the altar, and you in fact can't even see where the doge, a, a great amount of the space where the doge and signoria would mm -hmm. sit. Now, just to explain a little bit how I think the procession to the Salute worked, and um, failing any wonderful descriptions by informed architectural observers, uh, it's still a bit of a mystery, but more or less, the Doge and the Signoria would leave the Palazzo del Carbe. They would go down the Scala dei Giganti, through the Porta Media, and into the Iconostasis, where they would hear a low mass uh, in San Marco, that is. After that mass, they would leave San Marco and they would come into the Piazza here, and they would head for or before Napoleon's interventions, more or less the Bocca della Piazza over here. To the left of this engraving that you see here. They would go along to San Moise. They would go behind San Moise and they would go down what was then known as Cale Giustiniani, uh, now called Cale del Tre Dici Martire. A bit confusing, they've changed the names. Where a pontoon bridge would be erected for the occasion. They would go across the bridge with artillery firing as the Doge and Signori went across the bridge uh, to the site of the Salute. Of course, you have to remember that when they first started going there, which I think is very interesting, there was no Salute. There was a pile of foundations, and really for at least 15 years, as far as I can work, there was no church. So it would be very interesting to work about how rituals worked without the building they were supposed to be <laughs> happening in. I don't, know, I don't know very much about that, but it would be quite intriguing, I think. Once at the site, and on the right you see Marco Boschini's 1644 engraving of a procession to the Salute, which I think probably more than any other document uh, explains a great deal, at least, of how the church was conceived and, and used, uh, unlike most architectural photographs which never show any people in churches. Uh, <laughs> arriving at the site, uh, some debate about exactly what happened, I think, but more or less, the Doge and Signoria would come up the main steps and they would proceed through the nave here. And as you can imagine, the altar's coming into view, but always with a clear view of the main altar here. They would go through and they would be seated in this area to hear the Mass. Now again, there's some, I think, doubt, I mean, or at least a, a lack of complete certainty, where the choir, which also accompanied, the choir of St. Marco also accompanied uh, the Doge and Signoria to the site, where they sang motets and heard a Mass. Now, probably, they, if there were 24 singers, they stood behind the Doge and Signoria in this area, uh, and did not go into the, the friar's choir here, uh, although I'm not absolutely certain about that, but more or less, I expect because the design of the Redentore and Salute are very, very similar, that this is probably the function that they served. Now, why is an ambulatory design good for a ritual procession? There are many ways we might think about it, but certainly if the Doge and Signory are going in here, uh, the people, in a way, can be cordoned off they could enter by the side doors, which is what Longan explained their function was. They could be in this area here without impeding the, the Doge and Signoria who have to move through the church. 
you have to remember also that uh, the Dogens didn't really have to get out of the church. And once they've ended up in this space, it's awfully hard, and people crushing behind them, it's awfully hard to get out. And if you look at, for example, the Redentore, I'm not sure. You can just imagine that having entered through the only door at the frontier and gone up, you'd heard a mess. They turn around to get out and find that the natives, in fact, jam full of people and the Jojan Signori can't move. I, I think that may possibly have happened. At the Salute, by comparison, the central space reserved for the Jojan Signori is separated from that of the people. And also, the corridors that you also saw at the Red Torre are useful for the priests to get around here continue, as we know, that masses were more or less said continuously. You had, on feast day, you had one mass at one altar, followed by another one, by another one, continuously, then a high mass. I don't know if they worked around the church, but certainly there was always one going. So you can see how the friars here could come down their little passageway and get around here without uh, having to carry the host through the church itself, which I mean, you, you, know, you really shouldn't do. I think that is particularly interesting. I also wonder whether Byzantine ceremony had a lot of influence on the way the salute was designed. If we know how Constantinople functioned, uh, the church is there, that until the emperor entered the church, everybody had to wait outside in the narthex. Once the emperor stepped through the main door, the people flooded through the other doors. And I wonder whether, in fact, this sort of narthex arrangement here, in a way you can see, and that unlike the Rimitore, may have accommodated the same function that people perhaps did wait in here and flooded into the center of the church under the main dome after the Dersian Signory had gone into there. I'm not sure, uh, but certainly it strikes me as interesting that, uh, and just as a, as a sort of sidetrack, I mean, when we look at San Zaccaria, which I think is one of the most intriguing churches, and also the destination of an annual ducal procession. Why was there an ambulatory design which is totally um, unheard of in Venice at that time? Did the squole proceed around the ambulatory at the back? Uh, an ambulatory is an awfully good design for people moving around. It's only a suggestion. I'm not sure. After Mass, they more or less reversed the procession but very specifically, they returned to the Church of San Marco where another Mass was said, and then they went back to Palazzo Ducale. And I think that's very important to realize that they go to the site, hear a second Mass, and go back to San Marco and hear a third. And so it's a, it's a big sort of event. Mm. Apart from the ritual requirements for the Ducal Andate and Mass, which might properly be called the liturgical requirements. The design of the salute also appears to have been influenced by two aspects of theatrical design. The first is perspective sonography derived from the theatre. As Deborah's explained earlier, the most important site of civic ritual in Venice was the Piazza San Marco, and it was here that the first example of architectural and urban sonography can be found, as Sergio, probably his design on the left, was very keen to suggest, and you can see a sort of version of this clock tower in San Marco over here, all done out very nicely in a perspectival arrangement. More directly related to ecclesiastical usage is the scenographic effect of the interior of the Redentore, which many commentators have described as having a Sene Frons effect, and notably, of course, this was uh, Wittkover's great ar sort of argument about uh, church planning in Venice in the later 16th century, and onto the Salute was this scenographic effect uh, by these pilasters which focus the vision inside the church. In addition to this, there are descriptions in the Libro Ceremoniale held at the Archivio di Stato of Venice which describe how the Piazza San Marco and the architectural interior of San Marco were transformed by temporary decorations on several occasions in the form of a theatre. For the visit of Francesco Sforza in 1530, the Piazza San Marco was fitted out as a temporary theatre. More specifically, in 1613, the Church of San Marco, the interior, was transformed for the Feast of the Santissimo Sacramento when the host was exposed for 40 hours. The feast day procession included the Doge, Collegio, and Senate, and I quote, the church was ornamented from the stairs of the choir to the main door 
in the mode of a theatre, with silk cloths and many good carpets. The altar was placed at the door of the choir, and it made a prospectiva, which ended at the small pilasters, and posts with cloths were placed on the piazza, like on the day of Corpus Christi. This description of the interior of San Marco being transformed by theatrical perspective effects is an obvious precedent for the effect of the interior of the Salute. Marco Boschini's 1644 view on the right, and you can't see the perspective that well, but I'll show you it's there in the small detail in the center. Uh, his design, although formally derived from the engravings for theater design that he did, is the most instructive image of how, uh, that we have of the Salute. It shows how the receding succession of arches culminating in the main altar do in fact create the effect of a stage set with perspectival recession. Thus the temporary effects in San Marco are realized in permanent form at the Salute. The other type of theater, the floating Teatro del Mondo, was a burgeoning phenomenon of the latter half of the 16th century and one which influenced Longuena's design for the Salute. From 1557 with the, with the Acesi's Teatro for the Dogaressa Priuli, there was a succession of these teatri built to float in the Bacino, just in front of the columns on the Moro. These teatri were usually circular, with many columns, often of simulated marble, and with a dome, a small lantern above, much like the dome of a church. These were often referred to as macchine. Surely one of the most interesting was that divine designed by Vincenzo Scamozzi for the 1597 coronation of the Dogaressa Morosina Morosini Grimani that you see on the right. Uh, in conception and design, the Salute is much to these teatri, and in many ways it can be seen as a permanent Teatro del Mondo floating in the Bacino because of its shape and its spectacular location just behind the Dogana del Mare. If the Teatro del Mondo is a less obvious form of temporary architecture which influenced the design of the Salute, that of temporary triumphal arches erected on the Molo and at the Lido for the entrances of important foreign dignitaries is a much clearer influence on the great triumphal facade of the Salute. Apart from the permanent triumphs found in the Arsenale Gateway, the Ducal Palace Complex and San Savino's Loggetto, the series of temporary triumphs of the second half of the 16th century for entries and coronations is well recorded. An arch was erected on the Mola for Dogaressa Priuli in 1557 and another for Dogaressa Grimani in 1597. Palladio designed an arch and lodge on the Lido for the entrance of Henry III into Venice in 1574. But arches were regular occurrence, and two arch and others constructed the foot of Rialto Bridge to celebrate the victory of Lepanto in 1571. On the left you see Dogaressa Grimani, on the right Palladio's 1574 arch and lodger. Palladio had developed the topology of the temple facade as applied to churches in Venice with San Pietro di Castello, San Francesco della Vigna, which you see on the right, and San Giorgio Maggiore in the Redentore, you see San Giorgio on the left. But in his built work in Venice, the motive of triumph is, I think, absent. By contrast, the Salute principal facade clearly states the triumph theme as part of the rhetoric which the Serenissima wished to associate with the commissioning of the building. I'll just see if I've got a, that of the red and The temple front is, aspect is present, but also the facade owes a great deal to the topology of triumph. Four very large columns set on high bases surmounted by substantial, if broken, entablature set the theme. The large central arch flanked by smaller arches between the lateral columns, the standard vocabulary of triumph, and the repeated and receding series of arches which appear uh, from the facade into the church and the high altar reinforce this imagery. The extensive program of statuary belongs to the topology of temporary rather than historical triumphal arches. Uh, the original iconographic theme for the Salute referred to the specific Venetian context of its commission, which was, of course, the triumph of Venice over the plague through the intercession of the Virgin. What characterizes the churches of San Giorgio, the Redentor, and the Salute is their splendid stone facades together with the dome soaring above. With San Giorgio Maggiore and the Redentore, Palladio established the scenographic effect for both churches sited across the Bacino of San Marco. Their visual splendor marks them both the sites of annual ducal visits, and the domes mark both the beginning and the end of ritual processions. The topology of domes links these new churches to their origin in Venice, the Church of San Marco, and Vitkova's diagram makes explicit the urbanistic link between these churches. There you see it on the, on the right. 
Longanus solute marks the culmination of its development with the most spectacular dome of all, located in the middle of the Bacino, linking all these churches. We've seen how the ritual requirements of the Venetian government begin explicitly to influence the design of ecclesiastical architecture. Much of the impetus for this comes from the temporary architecture erected for civic functions on the Bacino in Venice. This temporary architecture is a new manifestation of the 1550s and initiates a mature development in the use of the Bacino spatially and the site of ritual activity. The vocabulary of this temporary architecture also influenced subsequent church design. Baldessaro Longana's design for Salute incorporates the vocabulary of temporary architecture in terms of theatre and triumph and this was a vocabulary produced for the needs of civic ritual. Longanus' design is evidence of his thinking clearly in terms of how the church would be experienced by the visiting Doge and Signoria. This attention to experiential form is surely a hallmark of Baroque architecture and evidence of the importance of ritual experience in ecclesiastical architecture well into the 17th century. get on with them. And I'll introduce you to Bruce Archer, who is uh, a lecturer in the history of art at University College. Uh, so he's been long teaching here at the AA. And uh, he is author of a recent monograph uh, on the sculpture of Jacobo Sensby. Um, Thank you. Um, well, coming after uh, so many interesting and variegated uh, talks on a day like this, the only thing I, I believe the last speaker should strive for is brevity. <laughs> and I hope I won't let you down on that point. But uh, first I would like to uh, congratulate uh, Andrew Hopkins on a very stimulating and sensitive reading of the Salute. And I was very glad that he focused on the microscopic nature of ceremony, not simply the way uh, all too often in treatments of ceremony in Venice, people talk about there was a procession or people proceeded through the piazza or to the church and away, but he actually thought about how this unfolded because it's very easy to um, take this in on one level, but on another deeper level, the idea of what you might call traffic patterns um, did have an impact upon church design, particularly on centralized church design. And I'm sure if one um, looked into this very carefully, it would probably help to explain why so few centralized churches were built in Italy. Could I have the first two slides? I only have about six, so don't worry. What I would like to um, do in uh, a few minutes is simply to suggest um, other levels of um, what you might call structural thought that may have informed Longaina's design of the Salute. It is a marvelously chameleon-like building. It seems to take in so many aspects of earlier Venetian architecture, as Andrew pointed out. In particular, the morphology is that of uh, Palladio's churches, that's uh, certainly very clear and um, you brought it out very uh, abundantly in your comparisons with the salute and the facades which seem to reflect uh, San Giorgio and also the Zitelle. The church is nonetheless a very strange design and it's one that strikes me as pe peculiar in Venetian architecture. And I think this suggests that there are layers of uh, significance or meaning or input that informed Longaina's uh, design. If we look at the plan again, one thing that always struck me about the plan were these trapezoidal piers, which function very clearly as a way of visual uh, sight lines, directional lines, both from the center of the church to the radiating chapels, and also masking the transition between one side 
one chapel and the next. It serves as the uh, transposition between the central rotunda and the octagon of the exterior of the building. And seeing these have made me think that perhaps Longena and his patrons may have thought of similar types of churches where this kind of pier um, would form a similar service, uh, notably in pilgrimage churches. And if one looks at um, the, uh, this detail from Herbert Delving's um, fundamental study of the Santo in Padua, he points out the introduction of this kind of pyramid, uh, trapezoidal uh, shape of pier for the Santo, and also slightly earlier in the um, 13th century, San Francesco in Bologna, both of them uh, Franciscan churches, but San, uh, the Santo in particular was designed as a great pilgrimage church. And I've often thought that, uh, as Andrew alluded, that when one goes to a church like this, and uh, Delving pointed out the influence of northern Gothic architecture, particularly churches like Notre Dame in Paris, on the design of the choir and apse of the uh, Santo, particularly the way in which you get this radiation of chapels off a polygonal structure, and with piers that form a similar service as uh, structural and uh, visual service as they do in the Salute, that perhaps Longano, in addition to looking at churches in Venice, also looked at other important pilgrimage sites, because this was very clearly uh, in his mind when he was creating his design for the Salute. He knew, of course, um, as uh, we do too, that um, the rotund rotunda, one of his prototypes, was uh, a church in which initially there was both a circular, a rotunda project, and also a, quadr a quadrangular or um, Latin cross project. And here too, with the Salute, history seemed to repeat itself, but in this case, the rotunda won out. But the design of the rotunda is not uh, at all what Palladio would have done in the same situation. It does have a peculiarly medieval quality to it, which may be explained by the fact that the closest available uh, buildings of a similar scale that Longena could study in structural terms was the Santo in Padua. There is, of course, a smaller scale version in San Zaccaria in Venice, and I think in both cases, as uh, Andrew uh, said, the idea was that when there were great religious ceremonies occurring in the center of the church, the continual sway of pilgrims could come around this way in a traffic pattern which didn't disturb the central project here, uh, central happenings there. And I'm sure that this was the same idea behind the configuration of the salute, that if the doge and uh, signoria went straight through to the sanctuary, um, other people could filter in and around this way. Although one might ask oneself, if we had a more, um, we had eyewitness accounts that actually specified what happened, whether in fact there was a kind of circuitous route by the Doge and Signoria into the uh, sanctuary, whether there were visits to individual chapels, just as perhaps occurred, certainly occurred at San Giorgio Maggiore, when the altar of St. Stephen became the focal point uh, in the transept of the church on the Doge's visit on the 26th of December. So this um, is one uh, level of uh, structural input that I think must have uh, guided Longena's uh, design. But uh, also, of course, he was very much aware, and he alludes to the whole Mariological tradition of rotunda churches in his uh, initial 1630 um, statement about the design of the church. He comp compares the rotunda to the crown of the Madonna and he goes on in a way that shows he's very much informed about the tradition of polygonal or uh, centrally planned churches dedicated to the Virgin, uh, particularly a feature of northern and uh, northeastern Italy. It's also struck me that um, the Madonna di Campania by San Michele, which I'm showing you here in plan and section, is a, a church which is 
in Verona, on the periphery of Verona, one that was highly praised by Vasari, and one in which Vasari commented in his uh, account of San Michele's life that it was a great pity that San Michele died in 1559, just as work on this was beginning, because his absence compromised the whole project, together with the uh, niggardliness of the patrons in actually bodying forth the idea. Certainly, it's an unusual design, which I think introduces another level of discourse into this, that is the early Christian uh, formulas for century design churches that uh, San Michele and Palladio and, and Longena all knew very well. In many ways, it's like a kind of inversion of what one finds at the uh, salute. The octagon is on the inside, and the circle is on the outside. And here we know that the circle, which in fact is a, court, is a, is a covered uh, loggia, was designed for the circulation of pilgrims who came to venerate this uh, image, uh, miraculous image of Madonna, which was the origin of the building of the church itself. Typologically, again, they are very similar, and also this, the way in which San Michele attaches a mini sentiment plan, or mini sort of Greek cross plan, I would say, uh, transept and choir onto the rotunda of the Madonna di Campania is similar to the solution that you get here and also I think had some influence on Palladio's, the configuration of Palladio's triconch at the Church of the Redentore. I think over here We've got, uh, again, this is a section through the Madonna di Campania. On the inside, it's a much plainer, simpler church. But again, it's taking an early Christian idea, in this case, and decorating it and dressing it up in the vocabulary of Renaissance architecture. One of the churches which was particularly important, I think, for um, the Madonna di Campania, and also perhaps had a bearing on Longena's ideas for the Salute, was the Church of San Lorenzo in Milan, where again you have this large central rotunda dominating the, um, is the dominant element in uh, what is really an ecclesiastical complex with smaller chapels attached to the sides, originally in some cases uh, separate uh, entities which were then incorporated into San Lorenzo itself, but by the 16th century and certainly during the time when Long, uh, when uh, San Michele was building his church and Spallati was building the uh, Redentore, it was a, the rebuilding of San Lorenzo was a serious um, point of discussion among architects in the 1570s. So, I th and again here, probably if we knew more about the liturgical functions of buildings like this, we could understand how this configuration related to the kind of masses which took place and commemorations which took place here and also in a church like the uh, Redentore. So, by way of conclusion to my brief uh, comments, um, I would simply like to underscore the important point that um, Andrew uh, Hopkins made that it is necessary to think of the way in which these churches uh, function to see that, as with modern architecture in the 16th or 17th century, or indeed from time immemorial, the patterns of uh, traffic within them obviously dictated certain types of format and impeded other types of format. And I think if we knew more about this, it would help us to understand the way in which ritual and architectural design merged in the Church of the Salute. And I think also, if one looks at the way in which Longena very, uh, with great flair, managed to assimilate elements of earlier architectural styles, not simply going back to Palladio, but also going back even before Palladio to uh, Gothic and uh, even perhaps early Christian elements, structural elements or structural prototypes, one can see that in many ways his response to building the Salute is not unlike Borromini's architecture or the way Borromini rebuilt the Church of St. John Lateran. And indeed, um, I think one could say of, of Longhena here what Alessandro Galilei in the 1720s said of uh, Borromini when he uh, explained why it would not be wise to build a facade of uh, St. John Lateran in the style 
of uh, Borromini's nave in that he said that what Borromini did was to take essentially Gothic structural elements and fuse them with a stylistic vocabulary culled from Roman architecture to produce uh, an, a, a hybrid which from the uh, incipient neoclassical mode of or point of view of Galilei was uh, highly unorthodox. But if one looks at that in uh, neutral or unprejudiced terms, one can see that uh, in this sense, um, as in many others, Longena's response was that of a great Baroque architect. Thank you. Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> it's the moment we've been waiting for. Um, now, I think that this might be an occasion when we can perhaps ask some of our, our speakers and, if possible, um, help them to account for the the subject that they've set up for us. Um, perhaps we, I'd like to sort of, sort of finish up this discussion, this, this, this day today, just, just asking some questions and, and saying whether, how, how far do we actually go with, with ritual? And, and, and how have we been using this very tricky word uh, called display? And does it really help us a lot, as it were. Um, I mean, it would be nice to hear a sort of, some little bit of feedback while we're all here, uh, from perhaps our, our speakers, uh, as to how they feel about um, whether we are characterizing this problem uh, in, a, in a way that there's a long way to go forward, or whether we're we're sort of just looking at it and doing it descriptively because we're making some rather universal claims or we're making some rather universal terms. So I mean, I wonder if, um, I mean, I, I wonder if I can ask Denver, for example, to, to just put her on a spot here, to, to ask her to say something about whether she thinks the, uh, the concepts of, of ritual and display have, have been fulfilled in some way. Deborah, I'm putting you on a spot. Do you mind? I'm sure she does at the end of the day. But still, it would be nice just to hear us, to, just to get a little bit of discussion going. And I would very much like to invite you to join in this discussion and uh, see if we can say whether we feel we've got something out of this, this sort of set of presentations, which I, for one, have found very, very exciting and stimulating. Well, I'm, I mean, I, I, I suppose this is bound to happen since I invented the title of the conference. Um, I mean, my feeling at the end of the day is that to a certain extent, the two questions don't relate awfully well together, or in some interesting ways they do. Um, but I think we've really got two rather separate issues. One is a sort of moral question as to whether it, it, it's right or wrong to build great buildings uh, and grand buildings, um, which of course is tremendously complicated in Venice because of the tremendous sort of double identity. It's a republic, but it's also an empire. And, you know, in our 
conventional terms of antiquity, Republican and Imperial are two contradictory kinds of architecture. And I think, particularly in the gritty era, people were aware of the difference. I mean, this is this, the argument that Professor Conchino was, was um, bringing up very eloquently, that um, well, Vitruvius puts us in a big problem here, because Vitruvius is sort of the Bible for antiquity, and yet he doesn't really know the imperial architecture because he's writing before most of it's happened. Um, then, of course, the imperial stuff gets preserved in Constantinople, comes back to Venice, so we've got two sort of converging traditions, the sort of revival of antiquity through Vitruvius, clashing with a much more ceremonial kind of architecture from Byzantium, and this has to be resolved, and it's a constant area for discussion all through the 16th century. The squale have bring up all the moral issues again about display versus ritual, about display versus charity, I should say. Um, and then all this is somehow linked together by people moving through it. I mean, the buildings are not simply there to look at. They're there to be processed around, used uh, inside and outside. And, you know, the, co the questions are enormous. And I don't think we've got everything answered today, but I think a lot of interesting important questions have been raised. Also, of course, the, the constant question, um, which I, Robert Finlay has left now, but I know he feels very strongly about, which is, does ritual actually consolidate or conceal dissent, or does it simply describe a situation that is, is not particularly contentious? Um, I mean, Muir's view is that the ritual, in a sense, preserves the myth. I think Robert Finlay feels rather differently that, that the ritual is simply the state of affairs and um, the sort of day-to-day -day life of the city and that it doesn't particularly conceal a lot of underlying tension. Anyway, uh, I, I don't think I should talk anymore. I'm sure you're all tired. Um, it was, no, it's just nice at this moment, you know, while we're here, to see...